hello. Let's get right into talking about the books that I read in the month of February. It was a very mixed month overall. I really enjoyed my reading month. There were some I absolutely loved, some that I probably didn't read at just the right timing, and some I didn't care for quite as much. So let's begin with a couple reading statistics per usual. I do want to say that as of filming this, which is on Friday, I am still in the middle of two of these books. So hopefully these statistics are correct because I am counting on finishing them. I should be able to, I'm pretty confident. So as long as I do finish those two, then in the month of February, I will have read 14 books. Two of these are sci-fi, two nonfiction, one magical realism, four historical fiction. The magical realism was also historical. Two literary fiction, two mystery and one contemporary. I don't know, all of those genres are so hard for me to discern from one another. So they kind of just all jumbled together in my mind. So seven of the books I read physical copies of and the other seven I listened to via audio audiobook format. Nine books were by female authors and five books were by male authors. So about 64% of what I read was by female authors. Now I did have six translated books this month, which makes me very happy. Five of them were translated from the French and one was translated from the Polish. When it comes to pages read, 2,529 pages were pages I listened to audiobooks of. 1,704 pages were ones that I physically read for a total of 4,233 pages. So while the number of books seems higher than last month and still less pages read than last month, so it doesn't really matter all that much to me. I feel really good about what I'm reading and how much I'm reading right now because if you do the math, that's like 302 pages per book if you were going to average it out. I definitely read some shorter books this month. So those are all of the statistics I'm going to go over. I don't really know how I'm gonna organize this wrap up yet. It's gonna be kind of rambly compared to normal, I feel like. I'm gonna read some quotes per usual and just go with the flow because some books that I read later on in the month, my experience might have been hindered by what I read earlier in the month. So let's get into it. I wanna start off with the first thing that I finished this month and that is The Normal People by Sally Rooney. This was my first book by this author and now I'm dying to pick up everything else she has written and will look forward to whatever she writes in the future. For some reason, this just connected with me on a level that I did not expect. I was absolutely enamored and captivated from page one. I think that Sally Rooney just really has a way with words that translates well to my thought process. Now I did listen to this on audio, which some people said was probably helpful for me because I didn't follow along at all, but I guess there are no quotation marks, which would trip me up. So I think I'll go forward by listening to her audiobooks in the future, if that is common. In this book, we're following Connell and Marianne. This book is set in Ireland. He is very popular at school, but he doesn't come from money. And she comes from a wealthy family, but really keeps to herself, is very introverted. And it is just starting with their sort of secret relationship, but then we follow them for years and years throughout their life, how they help each other, how they hurt each other, how they need each other, how they love each other. So this definitely deals with some really heavy topics. There are probably lots of things I would consider content warnings for this, but oh my God, I'm just obsessed with this book. I did watch the adaptation, which I highly recommend. Those characters are cemented in my mind as the characters from the book. I think everything about the adaptation was phenomenal. I can't believe how much I love this. Like I really am so surprised. I don't want to say more about the plot because it's definitely not a plot driven story. I will say that I found Marianne very relatable at times with like self-destructive behavior and not deserving of love, things of that nature that I know made it resonate with me more than others perhaps, but I just found it beautiful in the writing, in the characters, and the nature of the story. So there are a couple quotes I want to read. They're very short, but they just give little tastes of what the book is like. It says, if people appeared to behave pointlessly in grief, it was only because human life was pointless. And this was the truth that grief revealed. She believes Marianne lacks warmth, by which she means the ability to beg for love from other people who hate her. I love 
what that quote has to say about people who seem cold. Life is the thing you bring with you inside your own head. Generally, I find men are more concerned with limiting the freedoms of women than exercising personal freedom for themselves. So there's a lot of social commentary, sexism, feminism, just so many different types of conversations that were relevant and relatable. It was culture as class performance, literature fetishized its ability to take educated people on false emotional journeys so that they might afterwards feel superior to the uneducated people whose emotional journeys they liked to read about. And last one, Marianne had the sense that her life was happening somewhere very far away, happening without her. And she didn't know if she would ever find out where it was or become a part of it. So I think that at first I thought it was just about normal people. And then as the story went on, I learned it was about people who want to be normal people and hi, hello, I relate. So I love this. I know it's very polarizing. I thought it was brilliant. Another one that I absolutely adored and finished early on in the month is The Island of Missing Trees by Alif Shafak. This is the first book I've read by this author and I will absolutely be picking up more. So we are sort of really following a love story between a Greek, I think it's a Greek man and a Turkish woman. I could have that flip flopped, but it is in a time of war. This is a historical novel. They are not allowed to love each other. Um, but the really unique thing about this is we have the perspective of a fig tree and it is not cheesy. It sounds cheesy. It's not, I promise you. This really talks about family history, immigration, war, love. It brings up so many important relevant topical issues of today, but back in, oh geez, when, when was this set? It takes place in 2010 for part of the timeline and then 1974 for part of the timeline and we are flashing back and forth. We're following the daughter of these people and this deals with mental health issues, this deals with racial issues, with war, with homophobia, all types of things that I think were handled with care and beautifully done. It is a book about loving nature and appreciating earth and so this fig tree is also telling the same story from its perspective and from the perspective of all of the animals and creatures and insects that it encounters as well it was just so brilliantly done there are so many pages that i turned down while reading this so i do want to read a couple quotes as well um one is you don't share a language you think and then you realize the grief is a language we understand each other people with troubled pasts. That is what migrations and relocations do to us. When you leave your home for unknown shores, you don't simply carry on as before. A part of you dies inside so that another part can start all over again. Later on it says, humans are strange that way, full of contradictions. It is if they need to hate and exclude as much as they need to love and embrace. But if you are going to claim as humans do to be superior to all life forms, past and present, then you must gain an understanding of the oldest living organisms on earth who were here long before you arrived and will still be here after you've gone. Speaking of the environmental nature of this, being the plant lover I am, if you could possibly guess that. He knew even back then that she was prone to bouts of melancholy. It came to her in successive waves and ebb and flow. When the first wave arrived, barely touching her toes, it was so light and translucent, a ripple that you might be forgiven for thinking it insignificant, that it would vanish soon, leaving no trace, but then followed another wave and the next one, rising as far as her ankles, and the one after that covering her knees, and before you knew it, she was immersed in liquid pain, up to her neck, drowning. That's how depression sucked her in. So we're definitely dealing with mental health issues. The writing was absolutely stunning. I loved following all of the character relationships, side characters. I loved the fig tree perspective and the animal perspectives. I just think it was absolutely beautiful. And the author's voice was very clear, but it was still subtle and it wasn't overdone. I can't re recommend this book enough. Absolutely loved it. Okay, then I wanna get into a couple that I read for February in France, since I read five books this month translated from the French. The first one of those being The Elegance of the Hedgehog by Muriel Bradbury, translated from the French by Alison Anderson. Okay, so you guys had a lovely 
things to say about this book. It's a lot of people's favorite book from what I heard and I am so sorry to say I did not have the same experience. I listened to the audiobook for this and I do recommend that because one of the point of views is from a very young 12 year old girl and the girl who narrates it is very young herself. So I think that added a lot to the tone of the book. Paloma, the younger girl, absolutely my favorite part of the book. She was delightful, but we have Renee, the concierge of this building was probably one of my most hated characters I've ever read about in my life. I absolutely detested her POV from start to finish. I felt nothing for her other than annoyance and like she's the most pretentious, condescending, annoying, mean, unlovable character there is. And I know that's the point, but I think that an author can do that successfully and for me it wasn't. So we kind of follow these two separate storylines and they do obviously interact. The, the little girl who lives in the building and the concierge. And they both sort of see human beings as a waste of existence. And I don't want to, I don't think it's spoiling to say because it's pretty early on. Paloma, the little girl, does not want to become an adult. So she plans to, before she turns 13, commit suicide and end her life because it's pointless to continue on living. She's starting these journals, one of like the beauty of movement type of thing, and then another for profound thoughts. Um, the concierge is just dealing with day-to-day -day things and people she meets and interacts with. So Paloma's story I loved, a lot of the profound thoughts listed just as they are, had a lot of really nice things to say. I really enjoyed those sections the most. I think they were very, very on the nose. I think these themes could have been explored in a much more understated, subtle way that was not hammering you over the head. In fact, I have seen these themes all explored in better ways, in my opinion. So I know what this book was trying to do, and I think that it was trying to be charming and sweet. It just completely missed the mark for me. I don't regret reading it and I still would recommend it for people that think that that sounds interesting because I did enjoy parts of it, but Paloma's parts are much, much, much smaller than Renee, the concierge. And so the majority of the time we're following this terribly pretentious, unlikable character. One of my most hated protagonists I've ever followed in a novel. So I really wanted more from Paloma. That's all I'll say about it, I suppose. I'm glad that I read it. I really am. I do not regret reading it. And I don't think it's a bad book. I just think it was too obvious, too on the nose for me. The next book I also listened to is Disoriental by Nagar Javadi translated, translated from the French by Tina Kober. This was such a shocking surprisingly good read to me. I just randomly picked it up based on someone's suggestion for February in France and absolutely thought it was so entertaining. It's very dark and I guess, okay, we're following a main character basically all in one day as she's going through this artificial insemination process because she wants to have a baby. Um, you're sort of given very little information and the entirety of the story I think takes place in like one day or very short amount of time with all these flashbacks in between, basically from the start to catching up with where we are now of our main protagonist's life and how she is really trying to come to terms with who she is, how she does and does not fit in with her family. It deals with a lot of really important topics. Again, immigration, war, your sexuality, family pressures, societal pressures. So our main character fled Iran at 10 years old with her mother and sisters to meet her father in France. And there are some tragic things that happen in her family and we go through bits and pieces of that time and what it was like for her to have to flee her country and literally be in danger and horrible living conditions through that time. Fears and worries of going forward, going to a new place, feeling like she doesn't know where she belongs or who she is from having to go through with this, knowing she doesn't quite fit in with her family's beliefs. And there is a bit of a twist in this. It is a bit of a mystery at times. It's definitely a family saga. And like I said, I listened to the audiobook of it. I definitely recommend the audiobook. I think that it pretty seamlessly went back and forth between the timelines. I enjoyed 
learning about Iran, a lot of things I didn't know. And I appreciate that it wasn't just a story set in France about France. It was more so like how she perceives their culture and how she is perceived by them. So we're really dealing with a lot more um, and it's a lot bigger scale. But like I said, the story really zooms in on her one day as she's going through something and then we evaluate her whole life. I think it was beautiful and I really recommend it. Next, I wanna talk about another that could potentially be a favorite of the year and that is Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. This absolutely blew me away, okay? I know it has endless praise, but I did not expect it would be a story for me. In this, we are following Shakespeare's family, his wife and children. He's really not much a part of the story at all. And in fact, he's never named. He's always referred to as the husband, the son, the father, things of that nature, which are really appreciated. So this is a very oh, dark, sad, reflective, grief feel novel. You will grieve with this family and these characters in ways that I think that I didn't know were possible from a fictional book. Maggie O'Farrell is a freaking brilliant author to evoke the emotions that she did from me while reading this. I was just completely blown away and also for it being so slow paced, so descriptive, so zooming in on certain things, I really thought that it would get boring at times and I was absolutely never bored. I couldn't wait to pick it up every single time I put it down. So this is set in 1580 when we have the Black Death, we have the plague, and Hamnet's son dies. And so we just follow the family. But I think the reason that this was so such a favorite for me was the way that Maggie O'Farrell wrote Agnes's character. Agnes is like a favorite character of all time. So I want to just read a couple quotes about her. She is like no one you have ever met. She cares not what people may think of her. She follows entirely her own course. He sits forward, placing his elbows on his knees, dropping his voice to a whisper. She can look at a person and see right into their very soul. There's not a drop of harshness in her. She will take a person for who they are, not what they are or what or ought to be. He glances at Eliza. Those are rare qualities, are they not? She grows up feeling wrong, out of place, too dark, too tall, too unruly, too opinionated, too silent, too strange. She grows up with the awareness that she is merely tolerated and irritant, useless, that she does not deserve love, that she will need to change herself substantially, crush herself down if she is to be married. That just kind of gives you a little glimpse into who she has as a person. There's also this like magical realism element that nobody talks about that I wasn't expecting with her like witchy type of characteristics that I absolutely loved and added so much to the story as well. So I just wanna read one more quote about the grief portion. What is given may be taken away at any time. Cruelty and devastation wait for you around the, around corners, inside coffers, behind doors. They can leap out at you at any time, like a thief or brigand. The trick is never to let down your guard. Never think you are safe. Never take for granted that your children's hearts beat, that they sup milk, that they draw breath, that they walk and speak and smile and argue and play. Never for a moment forget that they may be gone, snatched from you in the blink of an eye, born away from you, like thistledown. So as you can see, all those tabs pages I turned down because I thought it was so stunningly written. I could just talk about this book for like an hour because I loved it so much, but I'll try to spare you. Okay, next I want to talk about another pleasant surprise for me, and that is Crossroads by Jonathan Franzen. This is the first novel I've read by this author, but it will not be the last. I did listen to this book on audio, which I think was a fantastic choice because it's definitely such a character study and slow paced at times, but it didn't feel that way by listening to the audio. I mean, I love slow paced character studies, so that's something that really suits me anyways. This takes place in 1971 and it doesn't span a long time within the present day story, but it's a lot of flashbacks. We're just following this family. This father is the assistant priest or what have you at this more modern church and we follow him and his family. So we have an older son who is sort of in defiance of his family. We have the next down the daughter who's popular and lovable and then we have another son a little bit younger than her who is selling drugs getting into some bad things and then there's the youngest son that we don't really talk about too much in this story we have the mother who just is feeling unappreciated and not really truly too in love with her husband at the time being and we have the dad the priest the husband who is 
is it pastor? I'm sorry, I'm not meaning to mess those up. Who is wanting to have an affair because he's very unsatisfied and unhappy in his marriage. And this book really solidified that I freaking love family saga dramas. Like, please give me all of the family dramas. I don't know how this book could be as interesting as it was, but it was unputdownable. I couldn't stop listening to it. Every time I wasn't listening to it, I wanted to listen to it again because I was so invested in their stories. Now I will say like all of my issues came into how this book ended. I like very open-ended things. I'm not used to things being resolved as much as they are in here. And we sort of flash forward into the future a bit to get a look at, okay, this is where they ended up and here, and I'm not saying it's happily ever after, but I would prefer to do without all of that. And I would prefer to just have it cut off and leave it more to the imagination. Cause I think that rushes things a bit. So that is particularly where I think most of my complaints lie. I think the rest of the time, the pacing was spot on. The characters were very interesting. They felt very realized and realistic. They felt very true to character the entire way through. I was fascinated by their histories. I loved the setting being historical in the 1970s. And they just were all so interesting to learn about their interactions. It feels great to see regular families being dysfunctional. I, I don't come from like a dysfunctional family, but it's just great to see like normalcy that people have problems and that's normal and regular. Um, so we're definitely dealing with a lot of heavy topics in this. I think I also love so much coming from a very religious upbringing, the amount of focus that this book has uh, on a discussion of religion as well. It is definitely a huge portion of it. And we're dealing with like time of war, different things like that. So yeah, I don't wanna say too much more because it's really all the novel focuses on and it's pretty long. So we're clearly like taking our time to do that. But I really recommend this if you're just interested in like a family drama in the 1970s dealing with religion, great time. Next, I'll talk about the Patreon buddy read for the month. I have a spoiler filled reading vlog for my patrons. Um, if you're interested in that for this book, this is a sci-fi, more like interconnected short story collection about a freaking pandemic. And when I tell you after reading To Paradise and How High We Go in the Dark, um, I'm sorry, by Sequoia Nagamatsu, I am not interested in pandemic fiction. I am pretty much just anything that is about a virus or a plague or anything like that happening and dystopia, I'm writing it off my TBR because I'm just not interested in, in the mood. Um, it's just really not something that I find I wanna read right now. I want more escapism than dealing with things that are like, could be our future or feel like present day situations. That is no fault of the novel. I should have paid better attention and realized that when we chose this for the buddy read. So this novel really didn't work for me. Like pretty much nothing about it worked for me. Um, I don't wanna say that it's a bad book by any means and I do think people will still enjoy it. But um, let's start with some of the negatives, I suppose. I didn't know it was going to be mostly short story collections that were not interconnected. I mean, there are some minor interconnections, but for the most part, you're just following different people and every single thing fell flat. I have tabbed all the stories in here. There's probably four or five that I barely even remember anything about. I do recommend the audiobook. That is the route that I chose for this and the characters fell completely flat other than the very first family we're introduced to. I wanted their story the whole way through. A few of them do show up later on, which I enjoyed, but I just felt like I couldn't care. Other than honestly, there's a story about a pig and that was the most emotional I got in this entire book was the story involving the pig. And I think that really says something about how the characters were written. But if you want to read this for more of like an ideas based, futuristic sci-fi novel because I think we get, I don't know, we get several years past 2030 by the end of this. You might like it because it does, I suppose, have some cool ideas of how humanity will change, how relationships and interpersonal communication changes, families, jobs, what jobs look like for people. Also like the setting of where people are living, colonizing other planets, what earth looks like. I suppose there are, you know, some ideas about what happens in this futuristic society, but they're all very basic level things I've probably seen before. There was really nothing like new or over the top interesting in this. And I know it sounds like I'm being very harsh. I'm just trying to be straight up honest about it. Um, so I didn't feel 
passionate about anything that happened in this entire book. I certainly didn't feel connected to the characters and it just really fell flat for me overall. And I'm sad, like I said, there was one story that really got me emotional and there were a couple others I felt connected to and the rest just not at all. And the ending I found confusing and out of place. The ending brings like this godlike magical aspect into it that's like mytho mythological, like reincarnation. And I just was very confused and thrown off by that when the rest of it is like so scientific. So if you've read it and you know that last chapter that I'm referring to, I'd love for you to kind of tell me your thoughts on that because I felt like it was so random and out of place in comparison to everything else that happened. So maybe pass on this or maybe you'll like it. I don't wanna discourage anyone, but it wasn't for me. Okay, one of the other novels that I read early on in the month is At Night All Blood is Black by David Diop, translated from the French by Anna Moschavakis. Now this won the International Booker Prize 2021, and this was a confusing novel to read. All I wanna say is it's historical fiction, World War I, we're following a soldier with a French army, and his friend dies in battle. And it's really about his undoing as he deals with his friend's death and the way that he copes with that and the things that he's done and what war has made of him. It, it is really an interesting book. There's a lot of metaphors about, oh, I forget how, what the like myth is called, but it very much sexualizes women several times in a way that I really, really hated. Just little lines here and there or like a paragraph that I was like, okay, gross and unnecessary. That just left a really bad taste in my mouth. After speaking with some people who are more educated on these things than me and my Patreon, they said that it is part of the African history of the time being, like mythology and tales. So I get that it makes sense within the story, but it's still not something I'd prefer reading because I just, I don't like to. Um, but that was a very minimal part of it, I think. Um, I loved the way the story was written. I loved the writing style. It was very, uh, I don't wanna say choppy, but short and repetitive. So I really did enjoy the writing and it sort of makes sense by the time you get to the end. And I loved sort of seeing the demise of this character's well-being. And you don't really know what happens by the end. I had to do a lot more reading because it was very confusing at the end. So since it is so short, I don't wanna say more than that. I think if you're at all interested in what I'm saying, go ahead and pick it up because it's, it's something that really makes you think a lot it is very, dark and philosophical and read it just for those reasons. Don't go into it thinking you're gonna have a good time reading an enjoyable book. Okay, next was sort of another miss for me and that was Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Torkazak. I think that's how you guys said to pronounce it. This is translated from the Polish by Antonia Lloyd-Jones and I've heard nothing but such high praise for this book and it just completely didn't work for me and fell flat. That being said, I will try from this author again in the future because I really liked her ideas. The writing just didn't work for me. I did not like the writing style at all and I don't know if that has to do with the translation or the story itself. So we'll try again with the books of Jacob and we'll see. This is a set in a small Polish village. We're following a very much like recluse main character who really doesn't like humans, who really likes animals and being outdoors much more and it is a murder mystery okay and your girl doesn't like murder mysteries i don't like mysteries in general they're not my genre so i need to start looking out for that better when i'm looking at a synopsis for books because if it's a mystery nine times out of ten i'm not gonna like it so basically early on we learn that our main character thinks that uh, animals are taking revenge on people in this town and killing people that have harmed them clearly i liked a lot of the ideas and quotes in this because there's a lot i've tabbed so you me being the vegan that i am an animal lover i should absolutely love this idea and i loved how our main character was so like offbeat compared to society she really did not want to conform and fit in with everyone else she purposely tried not to and just her way of thinking was very special and unique so i appreciate that a lot however 
I think just the mystery element got me so bored at times. Um, I was very, very bored through like random descriptions of things that were happening or had happened. And it was just more so when she was in her own head, thinking about the way she is and who she is, I enjoyed those moments. I feel like the end you see coming from the beginning. So like it's not plot twisty or surprising whatsoever. It's more predictable. So I should have loved this and I loved the ideas. It just completely didn't work for me, but I mean, a lot of people absolutely love it. So I don't think it's a bad book by any means. And I will try from this author again. Okay, a couple more that I randomly picked up because my friend from work had just bought this book on philosophy. And I was like, yo, I wanna get into philosophy too. And I looked it up and it happened to be translated from the French. So I was like, now's the time, let's do it. But that's actually the one I'm gonna talk about second. The first book by this author that I also purchased and read in February is The Stranger by Albert Camus, I think is how you said to pronounce it because I have been pronouncing it incorrectly. So this is translated from the French by Matthew Ward. I'm not really going to get into this because it's so short, but you can see lots of pages turned down. We're following a man who is extremely unlikable. Everything in this whole world is extremely unlikable and he commits a murder randomly and we're following his prosecution and evaluating that. So even this is a mystery novel, it's also very philosophical and the point of the novel is not the story, but the questions that it makes you ask yourself and the things it makes you ponder. So immediately off the bat, you meet his uh, neighbor who is a dog abuser, absolutely horrid. You meet another neighbor who is a woman abuser and sexist, misogynistic man also horrible. There's racism in this. There's just so many unlikable people and characters that I couldn't stand it. I hated it. <laughs> I liked the ideas. I liked what it made you think about because there's a lot of discussions to be had about committing unreasonable, terrible acts for no reason. Is there a reason behind them or did you just do it? Um, so that's really a lot of what it's evaluating. It's not that I dislike the story. I definitely enjoyed his writing tremendously. It's just, I had a hard time reading about so many unlikable things. And it's also like about a murder, which doesn't interest me at all, but I still definitely recommend this. Like I didn't, I didn't dislike the book, even though it sounds like I did. I'm still glad I read it, but do not pick this up being like, this is gonna be an enjoyable book because it's not. And this is the last of four books that I read this way. So I'll talk about that in a minute after I talk about the myth of Sisyphus, one of the nonfiction books that I read this month by the same author, translated from the French by Justin O'Brien. A crucial exposition of existentialist thought. Now, a lot of the other authors and philosophers referenced in this went over my head because I'm not familiar with them. Um, as you can see, tons of turned on pages. I loved a lot of what this book had to say. It says in the very beginning, there's but one truly serious philosophical problem and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. And I really don't think that it's actually too much evaluating suicide. I don't know, we, we make a lot of connections between different things that he really evaluates throughout this essay, but I will say it, it brings up a ton of really interesting questions for you to think about. And the way that it ended was absolutely lovely. I, I loved the last paragraph so, so, so much. And it's something that I, kind of like live by, right? So I am not a nihilistic person, but we're definitely talking about nihilism. And while I cannot say that I would read philosophical books like this every single month, I'm really glad I read this and it was not hard to read whatsoever. So if you're somebody who's nervous about getting into a philosophy book, I do think that this is a good place to start. It just once again is not a fun read. So when it comes to books that were not fun to read this month, I had four of them, right? Four very philosophical thinking books that were dark, unlikable characters that were hard to read, okay? Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead, The Myth of Sisyphus, The Stranger, and At Night All Blood is Black. And so I think I just really overdid myself with books that are philosophical, focusing on making you think, focusing on unlikable people, unlikable situations, and unlikable characters. 
I should have spaced them out more and then maybe I would have gotten a little bit more out of them. But that being said, I regret reading none of these books. I do recommend reading them still. And I've just really come to terms with the fact that like every book is not going to be all wonderful. I'm really glad I read each and every one of these. I just kind of overdid myself with it. So moving into the other book that was nonfiction that I read this month is Mediocre, The Dangerous Legacy of White Male America. I wanna read this because it is a good summary of what this book is about. It says, through the last 150 years of American history, from the post reconstruction South and the mythic stories of cowboys in the West to the present day controversy over NFL protests and the backlash against the rise of women in politics. She exposes the devastating consequences of white male supremacy on women, people of color and white men themselves. Mediocre investigates the real costs of this phenomenon in order to imagine a new white male identity, one free from racism and sexism. So I found this very interesting, very informative, and I really learned a lot from it. I wish I could get so many people in my life to read this. I really, really recommend this. I listened to the audiobook, which I thought was wonderful. I tend to listen to my nonfiction the majority of the time. So while I've read a couple books that have touched on these ideas before, this one was presenting a ton of new interesting facts in a unique way. And so there's really not too much more to say about my experience other than please read this book. Okay, and then let's go over what I'm currently reading and there will be inserted clips of my end thoughts because right now I am reading Escaping Exodus by Nikki Drayden. I am on page 130 out of 300, so nearly halfway done. I have Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, four days. I'll surely finish it in that amount of time. This is a sci-fi story. It is very much coming of age. It feels young adult. It is an adult novel, but if you are maybe new to adult sci-fi, this is a great place to start. It's very interesting because it's dealing with sisterhood and female-female relationships and friendships. And like I said, coming of age, coming into power. It is a matriarchal society, female empowerment, and they are transitioning into their new home, this new ship, which is a beast. It is living. So we're also taking a look at how them using this beast to help themselves is also hurting it. And that relationship I think was really interesting to analyze. And then we're also talking a lot about classism and how that affects society here. So well, I feel like it's something I've read 3000 times in the plot and narrative, the world building is very unique and the writing is unique and interesting as well. So I'll give a little tidbit here of my final thoughts. So final thoughts on Escaping Exodus by Nikki Drayden is that I recommend this for readers who are new to adult sci-fi, who are lovers of young adult fantasy and sci-fi and very tropey type of books. This turned out to be a coming of age royalty, taking control of the matriarchy line type of sci-fi story that felt like I've read three million times. I will be honest, I sped read the last 100 pages and skim read the last 50 because I simply didn't care. But I say this knowing I'm not the intended audience for this book. I don't really enjoy young adult sci-fi whatsoever. It is pretty much my least favorite genre. And while this is adult, it feels very young at all. So I stand by my statements before that the world building is very interesting and unique and there's cool elements as far as the ship goes, but everything else I've just seen so much. I didn't care about the relationships whatsoever. And I just felt like I've seen this story time and time again. But please don't let that discourage you from picking it up if you are interested in it because it is not a bad book whatsoever, just timing wise. If I had read this a couple years ago, probably would have loved it. So I won't be reading the sequel. And then uh, lastly, I'm listening to and I'm about 60% of the way through My Dark Vanessa by Kate Elizabeth Russell, which is a contemporary novel following a relationship that starts between I believe a 15 year old girl and somebody who is 42 Two years old and he is her English professor at this boarding school. So we're dealing with uh, just gut-wrenching, nauseating topics here. Um, ones that I didn't realize I related to because it brought up some very traumatic experiences that I 
head suppressed, I suppose. So it's putting it lightly to say that this book is difficult for me to listen to, but it's also extremely well written and beautifully done in my opinion. I, I'm i loving it. Um, I'll let you guys know when I finish it. But like I said, the writing is excellent. I think the exploration of how she feels when she is 15 versus when she's older because there is a timeline in 2000 and then 2017 and we really see the contrast. So as I said, people have a lot of problems with this book, but this book is very eye-opening in ways. As I said, I do think it's very realistic in a lot of ways and it is heartbreaking go into it with caution. If you are mildly worried about reading this book, I would say maybe don't. But that being said, I'm very much enjoying the book itself and the writing. So here's my final thoughts. Okay, final thoughts here. I absolutely loved this. Loved this book. That's obviously hard to say because it's a very difficult to read story. But I also think that it's extremely important that there's a fictional novel like this to bring awareness to the situation. It actually caused me to remember some things that my brain had suppressed and made me forget happen. And that was pretty traumatic for me, but it did help me to process my emotions and realize that the things that happened weren't my fault. And so I think that this book could be really actually helpful for a lot of people in that way. And I know some people think that it's like gratuitous and doesn't need to be explored in the way that it was. And I think that that's wrong coming from someone who has experience of things that have happened in this book. I think so much of this felt very realistic. It broke my heart. It disturbed me truly to the core at times. And I just think that it was so well written. I can't think of any complaints I have off the top of my head of anything that I disliked about this book. I really just only have positive things to say. So I will definitely look out for what this author writes next and go into it with caution if you're planning to because it is very dark and disturbing, but it was beautifully written and very tastefully done while disturbing you and making you uncomfortable in my opinion. And I like those types of books. So I do definitely recommend this. As much as you can say you enjoyed reading it, I enjoyed reading it. Okay, there you have it. All the books I read in the month of February. Let me know if you guys like this rambly format or if you have some other preference for the way I go about reviewing books in the future. Have you read any of these books? Please let's discuss them in the comments. That's my favorite part, hearing what you guys had to say about these books. Or if you haven't, are you planning on picking any of them up now after hearing a little bit more about them? I'd love to chat with you guys more. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.